Father, we are utterly, completely dependent upon you for understanding, for power. We just pray the Holy Spirit will have total freedom. We don't want to quench the Spirit. We don't want to grieve the Spirit. We want Him to just move in our hearts and minds and lives. Forgive us for the times we resist you and therefore lose that joy in our lives. We just open ourselves to you now. We're looking to you. We want you to be the center of everything. We want you to be the focus, Lord Jesus, as we give you all the glory and all the attention, asking for your power in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you came in, you were given a sheet, and um, there are, if you look at the second sheet, there are seven circumstances, and it might help you to follow that pattern. There are seven circumstances that we're going to look at in which God's people in the Bible and us today can find that prayer and fasting can completely change us in those circumstances. So we'll be looking at the Bible mainly, and um, you can either look it on your phone or have it in front of you as, as a book. You will find it helpful to have it in front of you. Um, and seven circumstances. The first one, in a crisis. In a crisis. We all face crisis from time to time. So um, we're going to have a look at um, crisis. Okay, give them my love. Um, and the first one is this guy Jehoshaphat. Now, why is it we call our... What, here's the challenge. Why do we never call our kids Jehoshaphat? We call them every other Bible name but not Jehoshaphat. But he's a great guy. <clears throat> by the way, by the way, please don't think that just because you've given your kid a Bible name, they're going to turn out all right. Some of the worst kids I've ever taught had a Bible name. It's, it isn't a magic formula. It's great in many ways, but don't just rely on that evangelical formula. If I give my kid a Bible name, they're going to turn out all right. No, man. You've got to work on them. You've got to pray with them. And uh, here's Jehoshaphat. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. We're going to look at three people who, who actually faced a crisis. And I want you to follow this. It is such an exciting story. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 2. Do you see it? It's in your Bible. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is in, in, in Gadai. So here he was, the king of Judah, and a massive army is coming, far greater than he could ever defeat. He's in a crisis. It's probably not one of us who have not actually been in a crisis at some point. Maybe you're in a crisis right now. So what does he do? Phone a friend? Send a Twitter? We do everything but the right thing, don't we? Joshua, what does he do? Well, look at verse 3. That's in your Bible too. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Straight away, he doesn't even bring his army generals in. He doesn't call a special uh, cobra meeting. He talks to the Lord. Do you see that verse 3? Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And here's the thing for us today. He proclaimed a fast for all the country of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. The answer to the crisis was to bring God into it. This is beyond our control. This is beyond our capability to solve this. What does the Lord want? And I love verse 18. Look at 18. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. So what is the answer to a crisis? Worship. Worship. And we tend to do everything else but. He's the last resort we turn to. Joshua said, no, he's the first. Worship. And what are you doing in that crisis? What you're actually doing is making sure your focus is right. Instead of focusing on the crisis, you're focusing 
on the King of kings and Lord of lords. You're focusing on the sovereign God who is in control of all the armies of the world, all the kings, all the rulers. You're turning to him. I've told this illustration before, but bears repeat. We were given vouchers to go up the Spinnaker Tower. And as we came past the all-important rugby fields, please don't, Simon, don't tell me the result. I haven't seen it yet, all right? I'll kill you if you do. <coughs> um, well, at least we beat South Africa last week. Anyway, past the rugby fields, and Ellis said, and this is some years ago, Ellis said the um, lipstick building is taller than the Spinnaker Tower. And I said, no, it's not. But she said it is. And I realized, of course, from the perspective of where we were, it did look bigger. So we went into the Spinnaker Tower, went into the lift, and I said to the guy, I guess your job is a bit up and down. We went to the top, and I took it to the big window, and I said, where is the lipstick building now? And she said two words down there. In the presence of the Spinnaker Tower, she got her perspective right. It was still there, and that stupid song that we sometimes sing, and in his presence all our problems disappear, is rubbish. They don't disappear. What happens is you get them in the right perspective. And what Jehoshua was doing here, this was a huge crisis. They were about to overrun the country. It was bigger than he could manage. So what does he do? He gets his perspective right. And he does that in worship. And worship isn't something you just do for an hour on a Sunday morning. Worship is an attitude of heart and mind 24-7. Even in the middle of the night. David often refers in the Psalms to, in the middle of the night I turn my thoughts to God. Because it's in the night time that problems often seem bigger than they really are. So he worships God. <clears throat> and look at the news in verse 13. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children, I love this verse, and little ones stood before the Lord. Is that how you run your family? All the wives and children and little ones stood before the Lord. What are you doing? You're, that's an act of submission. That's an act of putting God first. Focusing on him, worshipping him. God, this is bigger than us, but then you're bigger than that. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, verse 14, son of Zechariah, and the son of Benaiah, the son of stupid names, aren't they, Jael, the son of Mataniah, and a Levite of the descendant of Asaph, and he stood in the assembly. Look at verse 15. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Here's the key verse, key line, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Guys, if you're going to have your children come and follow the Lord, if you're going to have your colleagues, your neighbors, your families, if, if God, if people in this community are going to turn to the Lord, it isn't us going to do it. Because the battle is the Lord's. It's his. And what's happened? You've turned it over to him. You've brought him into the situation. You're worshipping the Lord. And look at 21, verse 21. Uh, 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat had appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. Now I don't necessarily suggest you talk to the head of NATO and say, Guy, if you really want victory, then maybe you should sing some Isaac Watt hymns. Maybe that is the answer. But it seems crazy. It seems crazy. Militarily, this was the stupid thing to do. Instead of sending your army out to meet that army, he sent out the, the priests and they were singing. In other words, they were saying, they were sending a message, you're stronger than us, but ah, our God is stronger than you. They were bringing worship into the crisis and they were thanking the Lord even before the crisis was over. 
And look at verse 24. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looks towards um, at the desert and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. God had done a miracle. This vast army that was surely going to defeat them, every single soldier was dead in the ground. God, when he's put in his rightful place, will help you in your crises. Maybe you're struggling right now with a decision in your life. Maybe there are big things that you're facing. But let me tell you this, our God is bigger than that. Put him in the right place, focus on him, and you'll see great victory. And so like uh, all the train drivers, these guys were really chuffed, but God had moved on their behalf. Now, what could they have done? They could have gone home and thrown a big party. But no, look at verse 27. Then led by Jehoshaphat. Very interesting. Uh, there aren't any wasted words in the Bible. The leadership, the king, took the lead. He called them to worship. He called them to fast. Now he calls them again. Led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over the enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lutes and trumpets. So anybody would have been a blast. But here they were. What did they do? They started their crisis worshipping God and they ended by worship as well. They go and thank the Lord. Remember the ten lepers that Jesus healed? Only one came back and said thank you. So when that crisis is over, do you go back and say, Lord, thank you. without you I couldn't have got through this. Do you see what Josh Hart is doing? He's bringing the Lord into every part of his life and his ministry. And so 29 and 30, the fear of the Lord came upon all the kingdoms of the countries where they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Joshua was at peace, for God had given him rest on every side. What do you do in a crisis? You fast. Why fasting? Why not just turn to the hymn book? I tell you what fasting does, it goes you deeper. Far deeper than normal prayer life. Fasting is part of what God requires. It is not an option for those who want to take God seriously. Fasting with prayer brings God deeply into your life and into your situation under a crisis. <coughs> Second person is Esther. <coughs> now you know that the Babylonians had uh, taken the people of Judah away as, as, as um, exiles and after 70 years they returned we'll look at uh, Ezra in a moment but a lot of people stayed on they had their businesses they they um, they, they were living there and they settled a lot of the Jewish people settled in Persia and being Persians they didn't want to pull the rug from under their feet and tell them to go home so they were settled there well the king decided to have a party his birthday party he decided to to boast about all the stuff. So he brought all his best china out and gold stuff and everything else. And then he thought, you know, I need to bring my wife and show her off, Queen Vashti. So he sent a word to her. He said, come down and meet, meet the nobles. And he invited all the important people of the nation, like Ari teachers and nobles and all those sort of important people. And they came and he was going to show off his wife, but she said, no way, mate. I'm not going to be just a shown off like, like a model. And then the noble said to him, hey, we're in trouble here. If you let her get away from that, when we tell our wives to go in the kitchen and do the washing up, they'll say, on your bike, mate, the king's wife doesn't have to do it, so why should we have to do it? So they said, get rid of her. And he did, he got rid of his queen, Vashti. Then he thought, crumbs, I haven't got a queen. So he sent out a big survey across the country and to pick a queen to replace her. Now, I googled Esther in the Bible in, in, in Google, and I thought, my, my lad, no wonder he married her. But he also made an, another appointment. He appointed a prime minister, and his name was Haman. And every time Haman walked through the capital of Susa, everyone said, Haman, and they bowed down to him. 
But one guy refused to do that, and his name was Mordecai. Now, we're a bit confused whether Mordecai was Esther's cousin or her uncle, but it seems reading between the lines that her parents had died and Mordecai brought her up. He refused to bow down because as a God-fearer, he said, there's only one person I bow down to, and that's the Lord God Almighty. Well, this really enraged Haman, and he vowed to kill Mordecai. And when he found out that Mordecai was a Jew, he says, I'll go even further, I'll kill all the Jews in Persia. Well, Mordecai quickly texted Esther and said, you're in the right place, girl. You're the only one who can actually get us out of this mess. And she says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me. Crisis. This would have been worse than Hitler did on this day of armistice. Worse. Fast for me and neither eat or drink these three days. So she proclaimed a three-day fast. Why not just a prayer meeting in the lounge? Because fasting shows God you're desperately serious about what you're saying to him. That's what fasting does. Fasting also makes you go deeper because it carves out quality time for God to get through to you. Now, Haman had actually prepared a gallows and cutting a very long story short, read the story while they're waiting for the kettle to boil. And at the end, God answered their prayer. And he was actually hung on the very gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Crisis fasting and praying. The third person in the crisis was Hannah. Childless Hannah. She, every year they go up to the temple and in the culture of their day not having a child was uh, basically saying, I've done something wrong. God is punishing me. That's the culture. So this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and she wouldn't eat. She faced her crisis with fasting and prayer. Worship. Getting your focus right again. And Samuel was born. The second thing, and we'll go, we'll go faster now. <clears throat> the second thing is when you get sad news. In a time of grief, in a time of bereavement. Um, and we have here in, in 1 Samuel 31, we have a situation where... The people of Judah are um, in battle. And Saul realized, King Saul realized they were going to lose it. And so he asked his um, armor bearer to kill him, but he wouldn't. And so Saul ended up putting the sword through himself and dying on the battlefield. He was pretty cut up about it, of course, but he died on the battlefield. But in 1 Samuel 31, it says this. The people of Jabesh Gilead, who actually had a special affection for Saul, it says that they took their, his bones and the sons of Saul as well and buried them under Tamarisk tree. And they fasted for seven days. Tell you who also died in this battle was David's best friend, Jonathan. So how does he react? Well, in 2 Samuel it says this, they mourned and wept and fasted. In a time of bereavement, in a time of grief, in a time of sadness, you take time out to wait on God. Fasting and praying. Not just that quick five minute prayer, the Nehemiah sort of prayer, but a prayer of bringing God into your situation. Fasting and praying in sad times, in grief. Nehemiah, of course, was one as well when he realized that the walls of Jerusalem were, were destroyed, it says this, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He was devastated the fact that the walls of Jerusalem were, were broken. And to him, that meant that his God in the eyes of the world was defeated. His reaction to that devastating news was to fast and to pray. And... He knew he was going to have to ask his king for permission to go and mend the walls. He was praying for that to happen. The third area 
when fasting and praying is very important is actually seeking, seeking the mind of God. Not one of us don't have times when we have to find out what God wants us to do. Sometimes small decisions, sometimes life-changing decisions. What should we do? How do we find the will of God? How does God get through? Well, I'm telling you, that five-minute prayer in the morning won't do it. It's taking time out and letting God get through. That's why we fast and pray. Letting God get through. We looked at the first last week in Acts 13. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, that's the leadership of the church, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them. The leadership of the church was fasting and praying and God spoke. Why do you think that as a church here we're about to enter into an exciting new chapter is because the leadership fasted and prayed many, 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 many months ago. And God spoke. God revealed his will. Leadership leads. And look what happened. Look what happened when that leadership was listening to God. Look at where all those churches came into being because a leadership team was listening to God by fasting and praying. We're all leaders in different ways. Leaders of families, leaders in our work, leaders in our neighborhood maybe. Fasting and praying means that God can get through. Many thousands of people became Christians because the leadership team was listening to God through fasting and praying. Sometimes when we're fasting and praying, we realize that God doesn't answer straight away. Rarely is God's timing our timing. And sometimes God says, yeah, mate, I'm on the case. But you've got to wait. You've got to wait. One of my favorite people in the Bible is good old Anna in, in, the, in Luke. There she was, an old lady, waiting for God to answer her prayers. And it says, she never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Can you imagine her joy when Jesus, the baby Jesus, came? Here we are approaching Christmas. Remember Anna, years and years of simply waiting on God. You're praying for your children? You're praying for that husband. You're praying for your grandchildren. Might not happen tomorrow, but God will answer it. When we show how desperately we serious we are before him in fasting and praying, God will answer in his time. Back in Judges, there was a, a real problem that these people had because the, in the tribe of Benjamin, a really bad incident had, had happened. And the other tribes didn't know how to react to it. They realized this is a terrible crime when somebody had been raped, gang raped, in Benjamin. And they thought, we can't let this go, it's serious. But what do we do about it? So do you know what they did? They fasted and prayed. You look it up sometime, Genesis, uh, Judges 20. They fasted. What should we do, Lord? This is a terrible sin. We can't overlook it. But they are our brothers and sisters. They are, they are our own family. What do we do about it? So they sought God in a time of conflict resolution. We'll always find conflict. We need to fast and pray. The fourth area is in protection. Protection. It's right that we pray for protection. Uh, Ezra, um, he, he, he was the guy that was going to lead the people back to Jerusalem after the 70-year exile. And he realized he had loads of people to take back, children, adults. He had to take them all back through hostile country. And do you know what he did? This is his prayer. There by the Haver Canal I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey. Do you just get in your car and drive? You could be dead by the end of it. Do you 
just walk out of the door in the front uh, on, on a day and just, you know, do you involve God in everything that you do? He says, man, I need to pray about this. Ask for a safe journey for us and our children with all their possessions. And he asks for the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him. But his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this and he answered our prayer. Amazing what you can pray about, isn't it? Spurgeon says, how about praying for that lost key? He says, how about praying for your journeys, fasting and praying for safety? And here it says, on the twelfth day of the first month, we set out from the canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he protected us from our enemies and bandits along the way. So we arrived in Jerusalem where we rested, fasting and praying. The fifth area is praying for the next generation. And I've deliberately linked this in with Ezra because did you notice back in verse 21 he especially prayed protection over children, over the next generation. Do you pray and fast over your children, over your grandchildren? That quick prayer won't do it. You're fighting the kingdom of Satan over their lives. Every day of their lives, out of your sight, they are facing evil. They are facing the attacks of the evil one. Prayer and fasting for our children and our grandchildren for the next generation is vital if we're going to pass on the baton to them. Every morning in our house at breakfast, I specifically pray for protection for Joe and Ella from ungodly influences. Specific prayer every single day. And I specifically ask God to protect their eyesight, what they see, what they hear from ungodly influences, which you have no control over. That he would guard their heart and their mind, protection from ungodly influences. If we're to grow the church younger, then we better start praying and fasting for the next generation. Remember I mentioned to you last week about um, Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. Every Friday they have a fast. Fasting Fridays they call it. And they specially pray and fast for the next generation. I mentioned this church as well. There's, don't be jealous when you look at that uh, that PA system in the middle. <clears throat> I'm jealous with the screen. But anyway, this church in Atlanta, uh, Mark's, Mark and Dessa's group has bought this book for their, for, their, for their small group. Best book you could ever read on this. It'll take your walk with God on a different level, I'm telling you now. You think you know God now, you read that book, you go on a different level of knowing God. And in this church, it was started by two brothers who just went around itinerant preaching and when one was preaching, the other was fasting and praying. And they started this church. There's 10,000 people in this church today. And just that you know, it's not 2,000, 3,000 years ago stories. Let me read you to this. This church fasts and prays for the first three weeks of every year in January. And they're seeing God move in spectacular ways. Let me just give you two modern testimonies. I have been fasting for my family and my children to get saved. And I've gone seven days with no food, just liquids. I was trying to decide whether to start on the Daniel fast today or not. Well, I'm not going to debate it any longer. Because after two years of running from the Lord, my daughter got saved this very morning. And I want more miracles in my family. Fasting and praying. The other testimony, we've been praying for my daughter in law for a year and a half. She's been on drugs since she was 14. She was up here this morning at the altar on her face, crying out to God. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. 
All your nice evangelical plans of bringing your children up won't work, guys. If you're not fasting and praying for your children, then what are you doing? All right, the sixth one is needing power for ministry. Releasing the power of God through fasting and praying, Elijah. A great man of God, but remember he was up the mountain and there was this context between him and the prophets of Baal. Who could bring fire down on the altar? Well, God proved that miracle. But you know what happened to Elijah? After this amazing event, amazing miracle, he got thoroughly discouraged. He got depressed. He even got to the point, he says, God, I want to die. Take my life. Often after the high, there's the low. A ministry is tough. Do you know what he did? He went on a 40-day fast. He didn't go on some stupid Christian conference. He didn't do all these things. He went on a 40-day fast. And he did a walk to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, and it was there that God spoke to him. He was discouraged. He wanted to give up. He wanted to die. It's not worth it. You know, we need to pray for people in the ministry. We need to pray and fast that Martin and Joy leave here encouraged. We need to pray for day. We need to fast for day. Ministry can be devastating. I'd never forget a conversation I had with my dad when he was just about to retire from the mission field in his 80s. And he said to me, I don't know what I've done with my life. I thought, Dad! Why are you so stupid, man? He went as a pioneer missionary to a tribe that had never heard the gospel in Central Africa. Thousands of people are in heaven today because we did. He said, I've done, what have I done with my life? But that's ministry. Discouragement. Down and out. The answer was fasting and prayer. Forty days. <clears throat> and do you know what happened? It wasn't the earthquake. It wasn't the wind. It wasn't the fire. It was a still small voice. What fasting does is let you hear the voice of God. In a manic life, in a busy life, you hear the voice of God. And he was recommissioned. He's got a, he got his fire back. He got his ministry back through fasting and prayer and listening to God. Powerful ministry. We've all got ministries. All of us. Every single one of us have got ministries. It might be a public one in the church. It might be to your neighbours, might be to your family. We've all got ministries. And maybe right now you're discouraged. I'm seeing nothing happen. Fast and pray. And let God do the work. Moses. Whoa, what a job. Here he was, now in charge of two million people. He had gone through the Red Sea. All those miracles had happened. But what do I do now? What happens now? He went on a fast for 40 days. Do you know what happened? God directed him. It was during that 40-day fast that God revealed his mind and the way forward. Do you know why we got the Ten Commandments? It was through a 40-day fast. Because God spoke. Please don't rely on every day with Selwyn Hughes or that little two minutes with your scripture union notes. It doesn't work. Fine for a little bit. Fine for a snack. You need fasting and prayer if you really want to listen to God. Apostle Paul, he went on a fast three days and immediately... The Bible says, read it in Acts chapter 9, immediately God gave him the power to preach and convince people that Jesus is the Son of God. It was through that fast that the letters that we read and our lives are changed. It came through a three-day fast. Jesus' earthly ministry of miracles, bringing people back to life, giving their sight back. All of it started with the 40-day fast. We cannot function as a church 
to really see the power of God in this community unless we're prepared to pray and fast. You can trundle along, you can do church, but if you want, really want to see God at work, we have to do prayer and fasting. And lastly, that's just for your encouragement, sometimes fasting is important when we repent. Read it up some time, I wish we had more time. Samuel here, the situation was that they were out of sorts with God. And Samuel called the nation together. He says, guys, if you want to get back to God, if you want the ark back in the country, which is a symbol of God's presence, then you need to repent. And in 1 Samuel 7 verse 6, it says, we have sinned against the Lord. They declared a fast. We know the story of Jonah. God was said was going to destroy, destroy them. They called a fast. And God right with God. One guy you've probably forgotten about is Cornelius, Roman centurion, didn't know God. He said, four days ago I was fasting. This was a non-Christian. Because he was so desperate to know God, he said, I was fasting for four, uh, four days. Do you know what happened? An angel came. I don't know what the Bible, you know, the Bible always records them as men in white. I don't know if they use personal, but Acts chapter 1, men in white appeared. And right, these, this angel came fluttering down and says, look mate, down the road there's a guy that does know Jesus. His name is Peter. Send for him. And so Peter came after a bit of a struggle with the Lord and he came. And the whole of Cornelius' house became Christians after a four-day fast. That's not Christians. Seeking God. God speaks. Saul, the man who persecuted the church, God blinded him. It's amazing the lengths that God has to go to get some people to listen to him. Amazing. He was blind for three days. He didn't eat, he fasted. And that was also not only a preparation for his ministry, but that was him getting right with God. Next week, in your small groups, not this week, the following week, you're going to look at Joel. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. The Jews every year, the first day of the year in Jerusalem, have a day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Do you remember that ends in your GCSE Judaism? Yom Kippur. <coughs> the first day of the year, they have a fast as a nation. And they seek forgiveness, so they go into a new year clean. Fasting for repentance. The Bible calls us to repent. The very first recorded words in Mark's Gospel that Jesus spoke was this, repent and believe the Gospel. Face that sin, turn away from it, and have faith. Because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. We take by faith that God gives us that forgiveness. Abraham was a great example of that. Look at the stars, Abraham. Your descendants will be greater than that. He says, what? I haven't even got a son yet. The life of faith is something that God calls all of us to. Remember when he was 12 years of age, Abraham took him up the mountain. God had called him to sacrifice him. And like a wise year eight, his son said to him, Dad, we've got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? Good question. And unwritten in the Bible, Abraham was asking the same question. What is going to happen? I don't know. All I'm doing is God told me to do this. I'm going to do it. Do you know what he said? I don't know the answer. But I do know that God will provide. Why do I know that God will provide? Is because he said so. That's faith. That's faith. Taking God at his word. Here was a father who was prepared to kill his son but didn't have to go through with it. I know another father who was prepared to kill his son but actually went through with it. Because you and I would not have salvation, we would not have forgiveness, we would not have eternal life without that sacrifice. Like Abraham said, God will provide the lamb and he did. The lamb of God that takes away the sin 
of the world. Are you saved? Are you part of God's family? Just because you're here in church doesn't mean you are. Are you born again of the Spirit of God? Have you repented of your sins? You see, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Sin is so serious, death has to happen. But Jesus has taken that death. So when we put our trust in him, we repent of our sin. But Christian, you might have been a Christian 50 years, you still need to repent. When the Holy Spirit brings conviction, because it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. But because he is both the lion and the lamb, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, he's also the lion that can fight your battles every day over sin. But the Bible calls us to repentance and faith. And that starts at the cross. And the cross of Jesus leads to another cross where he crosses out our sin and doesn't hold it against us anymore. So Paul said these words, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. I believe in Greenland, but I've never been there. Even the devil believes in God, but he's not going to heaven. This is a life-changing belief, a belief with the heart as with the mind. So PBC, are we going to rise to this? Is this another Sunday you just go home and cook your dinner and go on with your life? Or is God going to change us forever? Are we listening to what God... Are we going to rise to this? Because the only way forward for us as a church is prayer and fasting. Taking God seriously and seriously listening to God. As I close, I told you last week that in my personal daily quiet time I'm going through the book of Revelation. This week I came to chapter 3, that famous verse in verse 20. Behold, I stand in the day, the door and knock. Holman Hunt's famous picture, Christ the light of the world in St. Paul's Cathedral. But very wrongly, we take that as a gospel verse. We preach it in a gospel message. Behold, I stand at the door. It has nothing to do with the non-Christian world. Read it in its context. Jesus is speaking to the church. He's speaking to Christians. He's saying, why are you keeping me out? That's what he's saying. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Christian... Why are you so busy? Why are you so full of yourself? Why are you so full of your programs that you're keeping me out? Please open the door. Because I want to have fellowship with you. And you with me. You keeping him out? Christian? Don't give me all the jargon. Is he inside? And are you having fellowship with him? Open the door. Sometimes it takes prayer and fasting. Fasting helps you to listen on a deeper level. Don't just go for the two-minute quiet time. Start fasting and praying and really listening to God and seeing miracles happening in your family, in your neighborhood, and in this community and in this church. You see, when you really grasp the importance of fasting, not only do you become a more effective prayer, but you actually become a joyous, generous giver. Fasting is the key. Let's pray. Father God, we are not content with playing around the edges, with faffing around. We want to go deep with you. There is so much more and we long for our families, for our children, for grandchildren, for our families to know you. Father God, do miracles in their lives as we beseech you in Jesus' name. We want to see miracles in this community as people seek you. We saw what Cornelius, he was seeking for answers. There are people in this community who are seeking for you as we're faithful in praying and fasting. May miracles happen and people come to know Jesus. Take this, Lord, take the words and change us forever as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.